This video will provide an overview of how to care for small wounds. It will cover how to assess, explore, clean and close a small wound. The need for tetanus and antibiotic prophylaxis will also be considered. For this procedure, you will need a clean dressing trolley, a sterile dressing pack, 1% lidocaine solution, saline for irrigation and appropriate materials for closing and dressing the wound. A wound is a break in the epidermis or dermis. There are many types of wound. Common examples include incisions, which are caused by sharp objects, lacerations caused by blunt force, abrasions caused by superficial damage to the epidermis only, and puncture wounds where the depth of the wound exceeds the length or width. Although the wound may appear to be minor, the consequences can be serious if not treated promptly and properly. Small wounds may result in infection, loss of function, or a considerable amount of disfigurement, which can be highly distressing for the patient. As with any procedure, introduce yourself, correctly identify your patient, explain what you're going to do and obtain consent. Remember, wound care requires an aseptic, non-touch technique. Hands must be cleaned before and after every patient contact and before commencing preparations for the procedure to prevent cross-infection. Firstly, any bleeding should be stopped using elevation and direct pressure or tourniquets. Consider the need for intravenous access and fluid resuscitation if bleeding is significant. If sighted near a fracture, the wound is assumed to communicate with it. It should be covered with a clean dressing soaked in saline and antibiotics should be administered immediately. It is important to obtain as much detail as possible about the circumstances of the injury and how the wound may impact on the patient's daily activities. Certain types of injury are associated with a higher risk of complications. For example, a mechanism involving excessive force or a wound sighted on the neck or trunk. Wounds obtained in a field or garden are more likely to be contaminated with soil or manure and hence are tetanus prone. Remember to note any allergies to drugs, particularly antibiotics and any current medications such as anticoagulants as these may affect management. A great deal of information can be gained by visually inspecting the wound. Good lighting is essential. The points listed here should be recorded for each wound. Imaging is not necessary for most wounds, although examination cannot reliably exclude foreign bodies. Ultrasound or x-rays may be considered. If the patient consents, an initial photograph of the wound may also be helpful as a reference point to assess wound healing. Sensory deficits must be recorded prior to any further intervention. It is also important to ask the patient about pain. If movement is too painful, motor function can be assessed at a later stage, after the administration of local anaesthetic. Once assessed, the wound must be explored, cleaned and closed. If the wound is obviously contaminated or complex, exploration and closure should be performed in an operating theatre. Complex wounds include those which are large, contain foreign bodies or involve deep structures such as muscles and joints. A decision also needs to be made about when to close the wound. Primary closure is used for the majority of recently incised wounds, but risks infection since bacteria may be trapped within the wound. Delayed primary closure reduces the risk of infection in wounds older than six hours, dirty wounds, and crush injuries. Secondary healing is used when operative closure is impossible. In order to allow thorough exploration and cleaning of the wound, Local anaesthetic may need to be injected around the wound. 1% lidocaine is most commonly used. The wound edge is first cleaned with an antiseptic solution. Allow the solution to dry and trim any hair for at least 2 cm around the wound to prevent interference with sutures. Check the expiration date of the local anaesthetic. Then use a short 23 gauge needle to slowly inject a small amount of lidocaine under the wound edge, either through the wound edge if the wound is fresh and socially clean, or through the skin if the wound is grossly contaminated or contused. Once this small area is anaesthetized, inject through the same area to raise a wheel a little further on. Wait and then repeat until the entire wound edge is anaesthetized. In this way, the patient only feels the first injection. For wounds which are to be glued, a piece of gauze covered with topical lidocaine can instead be applied to the wound for 20 minutes. The wound can now be explored and cleaned. Meticulous exploration of the wound is essential to determine which structures have been damaged or exposed, and to identify foreign bodies. 
Particulate matter and contamination must be mechanically removed. If dirt is left embedded in the wound, this can lead to infection or a permanent tattooing effect on the skin. Cleaning is performed with a high pressure irrigation using a syringe, sterile needle and drinking quality water. Protective eyewear and mask should be worn in case of splashback. The wound can also be cleaned by scrubbing with antiseptic solution and a sterile nail or brush. A scalpel should be used to resect any non-viable tissue and to trim the edges of old wounds. Be extremely cautious in areas such as the face, scalp and hands, where skin is at a premium. Once thoroughly cleaned, the wound can be closed. Interruptible, non-absorbable nylon sutures allow drainage, reduce risk of tracking of infection, and minimise tissue tension and ischemia. If there is likely to be tension on skin sutures, or there are potential spaces within the wound where a hematoma could form, deep absorbable sutures made from polyglycolic acid or catgut can be used. Alternative closure methods include tissue glue or adhesive steri strips. The glue is applied to the carefully opposed skin surfaces rather than the open wound. These methods are effective for simple wounds as long as good apposition of wound edges is achieved. Skin staples provide a fast method of closing linear wounds that do not need a perfect cosmetic result, for example scalp or limb wounds. If the wound is dry, a clear vapour permeable dressing allows inspection. If there is exudate, an absorbent yet non-adherent dressing should be used. Some wounds, for example those on the face, may not require dressing. When closing defects in the skin, excessive tension should be avoided at all costs. If there is extensive skin loss or any skin loss on the face or hand, senior advice should be sought. Removal time for non-absorbable sutures varies with the site. Shorter duration reduces scarring, whilst longer duration allows wound strengthening. The removal time is usually seven days for most parts of the body. Exceptions include facial sutures, where four to five days is usually ideal, and sutures over extensor surfaces of joints or the lower limbs, which can be left for up to 14 days. Antibiotics are indicated in wounds at high risk of infection or with established infection. The most common wound contaminants are bacteria from the skin, such as Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. Bite wounds, however, involve a wider range of organisms, so broad-spectrum antibiotics should be prescribed according to local antimicrobial guidelines. Wounds that are dirty or complex are prone to tetanus. If the patient has had a complete five-dose course of tetanus immunization, further intervention is not necessary unless the wound is heavily contaminated with soil, in which case tetanus immunoglobulin is given. Booster vaccine doses are given to those with tetanus-prone wounds who either have not had all five doses or those who do not know their immunization status. This latter group will require a full primary course of tetanus vaccine.